Hey, everybody. I want to welcome you back to Border Patrol Watch. I'm Jen Budd, former senior patrol agent with the United States Border Patrol. Today, I am so excited. I am starting the very first in a long series of articles and videos about the Border Patrol's secret and illegal cover-up teams called Border Patrol Critical Incident Teams. This is meant to educate and expose these cover-up teams used by the United States Border Patrol. In this first piece, I'm going to explain what critical incident teams are, how they developed, how they spread from sector to sector, how they systemically covered up agent use of force violations, how they use the teams to mislead and lie to our court officials, judges, and even to Congress. So chances are that you've never even heard of these teams. Well, like I said, they're secret. Congress didn't even know about these teams until I came forward a few years years ago and disclosed their existence to them. And unfortunately, the teams were not covered much in the media when this happened. There were a few articles, but no outlet really did any kind of real deep investigation into what the teams are and what they have been doing for the last 35 years. The Border Patrol Critical Incident Teams are the largest known U.S. law enforcement cover-up team ever known to exist in our history. And although the Border Patrol and their parent agency, Customs and Border Protection, have stated that they have eliminated these illegal and secret teams, I have discovered that that is not true. But this first video, I want to be just kind of like a Border Patrol Critical Incident Team 101 so that you understand what we're talking about and how these teams develop. But before I continue, we need to go over a few things so that you understand what I'm talking about. I know that government and law enforcement talk can sometimes be difficult to understand if you've never worked in these areas. So let's go through these things first. Number one, prior to 9-11, U.S. Border Patrol was housed under the Immigration and Naturalization Service, which was under the Department of Justice. That's when I was in the U.S. Border Patrol. After 9-11, the government moved the Border Patrol under Customs and Border Protection, which is housed under the Department of Homeland Security. So that's important to know. Two, Border Patrol agents are the guys in green, and they work in between the ports of entry to apprehend anyone or anything being crossed without inspection. Customs and Border Protection, the parent agency to Border Patrol, are the people in blue, and they predominantly work at the ports of entry, and those are also airports, seaports, and land ports, inspecting every person and good that comes across. Three, you need to understand the legal authorities of the Border Patrol before we get into all of this. In order for a federal law enforcement agency to be able to create a new authority, they must first have that authority given to them by Congress. And there is no legal authority granted by Congress for the United States Border Patrol to act as evidence collection technicians or to investigate their own use of force incidents. That is very important. Legal authority for Border Patrol agents can be found under Law 6 U.S.C. 211, which limits the agency's authority to enforcing only federal immigration laws, customs laws, and narcotics laws, and to conduct preliminary investigations into these areas. The Border Patrol does not have the authority to enforce laws outside of those three areas. This also means that the Border Patrol does not have the authority to enforce DUI laws, traffic laws, or even arrest people for murder or rape. It also means that the Border Patrol cannot conduct investigations such as crash reconstruction investigations, use of force investigations, or even investigations into their own pursuit crashes, which injure and kill many people. Additionally, the Border Patrol's investigative authorities listed under the federal government's Office of Professional Management, that's like the federal government's Human Resources Department, they give the Border Patrol what is called 1896 designation. And that only allows for them to question in a preliminary sort of way, like asking you what your citizenship is or where you're coming from. Agencies like the FBI contain what is called 1811 series designation. That means they are able to go in and investigate crimes outside of immigration customs and narcotics so they can do 
bank robberies. They can do all sorts of thefts. They can do rape. They can do murder. They can do all sorts of very deep investigations, which the Border Patrol cannot. It's also important to know that Congress further limited Border Patrol's authorities through Statute 8 U.S.C. 1357. This law states that Border Patrol's arrest powers outside of immigration, customs, and narcotics are only legal if agents are performing their immigration duties at the time they encounter this other crime. This means that if I'm working as a Border Patrol agent down on the line and I see a man kill someone or beating someone, I can detain and arrest that person because I witnessed it and I was conducting my immigration duties at the time. I will not have the power to do further investigations, but I can arrest that man and turn him over to law enforcement agencies like the sheriffs or the police or the FBI. These limited powers are what prevents the Border Patrol from legally investigating their own use of force incidents. This statement is backed up by testimony from former Border Patrol Chief Michael Fisher in the federal court case of Socorro Quintero Perez versus Dorian Diaz and the United States. These are former Chief Michael Fisher's own words. Quote, in order to avoid any conflicts of interest, Border Patrol was not allowed to investigate incidents of lethal force relating to its own agents while I was serving as chief. I did not receive or review the investigations by the Office of Inspector General, the FBI, or any other outside law enforcement agencies who investigated instances of lethal force because I did not have investigative authority within Border Patrol. For any incident involving use of force, Border Patrol would compile a document entitled Critical Incident Investigative Team Report or CIT report. But those reports contain no findings made by Customs and Border Protection or Border Patrol or actions taken by the critical incident teams, unquote. That's not actually what happens. And I'm going to show you what actually happens. But at least he is stating the truth that the Border Patrol doesn't have the legal authority to be doing these investigations that they've been doing for 35 years. After 9-11 happened, the federal government created the Department of Homeland Security and created Customs and Border Protection underneath that department. And then within Customs and Border Protection, that's where Border Patrol was placed. The federal agencies that have the authority to investigate the U.S. Border Patrol and their use of force incidents. Those include the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General, commonly called OIG, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, known as the FBI, or Customs and Border Protection's Office of Professional Responsibility. It's kind of like their Internal Affairs Unit. That's also known as OPR. Aside from these federal oversight agencies that can look into Border Patrol's use of force incidents, state and local agencies may do so as well. So your local sheriff and your local police department and your state law enforcement agencies, such as state troopers and so forth, also have the legal authority to investigate any use of force incidents that occurs within their areas of responsibility. So when a use of force incident happens with the Border Patrol, the agency is required by law to notify all of these agencies that have jurisdiction. That means if a Border Patrol agent shoots and kills someone, whether it's a migrant or a United States citizen, they must notify county, city, or state law enforcement agencies with that jurisdiction. In San Diego County, that's San Diego County Sheriff's. If the incident occurred in the city, then we would call San Diego PD. Border Patrol is also required to call any federal agencies that have jurisdiction as well. So that would mean the Customs and Border Protection's Office of Professional Responsibility, Department and Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General, and the FBI must all be called. Any or all of these agencies may take the case or they may decline it and let the other agencies handle it. So what is a use of force incident supposed to look like? in the United States Border Patrol today. Border Patrol agents who are on the ground and responding to this incident are to secure the scene and notify their supervisors. The agents are not to discuss the case with other agents. They're not to discuss the case with witnesses, and they're not to talk to each other about what's going on. They are to provide medical assistance to the injured and simply stand by and wait for local, state, and federal agencies to respond. One last thing you need to know before we get into this, each sector's critical incident team was individually 
designed. They didn't come from Washington, D.C. The team started in San Diego and then quickly spread through each of the agency's 20 sectors. This is why they all have different names. So in San Diego, the critical incident team was called the Critical Incident Investigative Team, or CIIT. In El Paso, it was called the Sector Evidence Team, or SET. I have also seen these teams called the Critical Incident Response Team, or C-I-R-T. Additionally, the Border Patrol in some sectors also maintains what they call cross-border investigative units, or CBIUs. Whenever any of these critical incident teams, which they all are, whenever any one of these critical incident teams weren't available, chiefs of the sector would often use the sector intelligence unit or sometimes the smuggling interdiction groups, SIGs, to then do what the critical incident teams were supposed to do. So there are many agents and many different teams that are trained in evidence collection, even though they are not legally allowed to be doing this. For consistency in these videos and in everything I write, I will be calling all these teams Border Patrol Critical Incident Teams. Okay, now that we've gotten all these things out of the way, here's how the Border Patrol Critical Incident Teams started and what they did. In 1987, the San Diego Sector Border Patrol Chief created the first critical incident team within the existing sector intelligence unit. What caused San Diego Sector to design and create this team is somewhat of an unknown. In 1984, San Diego Border Patrol Sector created what was known the Border Crime Prevention Unit because there were a lot of robbings and beatings going on of migrants. What would happen is these banditos would come north in Imperial Beach and cross what back then was just a fence and then go north and wait in the canyons for the migrants to come through. And then they would rob them and beat them. And as this study from Adolfo Gonzalez from 1995 shows, these teams only lasted from 1984 to 1988 because the level of violence experienced by agents in the police department was so dire and so excessive. It was not uncommon for them to all encounter small groups of bandits working in the canyons together. Sometimes they carried sawed-off shotguns. Other times they carried pistols. In fact, in 1986, the Border Crimes Prevention Unit was confronted several times by these armed bandits who set up actual and literal ambushes for the agents that also included San Diego PD officers as well. So it was a joint task force between the Border Patrol and the San Diego PD. According to Mr. Gonzalez's study, the four years that the unit operated, members of the team were involved in a total of 35 shooting incidents that resulted in three members of their own team being shot and wounded themselves. So that is very excessive. If you are unaware, that's extremely, an extremely amount of excessive shootings. It's my hypothesis that this is what led to the critical incident teams being created by the chief of San Diego sector in 1987. I mean, with 35 shootings in just four years, that San Diego sector border patrol back then, that management was looking at dozens of possible criminal and civil cases being filed against agents and the agency. Not only were the agents' careers at stake, but the reputation of the Border Patrol was being tarnished as well. More importantly, spending the limited budgets that chiefs had to work with back then on awards for civil liabilities were a serious drain on the sector's finances. Additionally, when border rights groups began protesting the violence and the shootings committed by the task force, the pressure to do something mounted. Instead of doing the right thing and just trying to prevent so many shootings and beatings, the San Diego sector chief decided to create the first official Border Patrol critical incident team to cover up agent crimes. In general, each sector team had one or more critical incident teams, and each team consisted of a handful of agents who were temporarily detailed to the team. Then there would be a lead senior agent and a supervisory border patrol agent. Above the supervisor, the command consisted of a selected assistant chief, the deputy chief, and the chief of that sector. Temporary details to the unit required agents to be trained in identification, collection, 
and preservation of evidence. My research conducted into these teams has revealed that few agents contributed more to the development of these illegal teams than former Assistant Chief Patrol Agent John Buscaglia. In October of 2021, I discovered his public LinkedIn account where he documented how he helped develop the teams from San Diego and spread them to other sectors. As you can see here, John Buscaglia entered the Border Patrol in October of 1987. And according to his own writings, I assume it's his own writings on his LinkedIn account, as a Border Patrol agent in the San Diego sector, he was one of the first sector evidence team members where he states, quote, I was responsible for completion of reports related to fatality vehicle collisions and shooting incidents. I conducted interviews, documented and preserved evidence, and completed comprehensive reports for the service that were utilized in tort claims against the government. Please remember that everything he's stating here Border Patrol agents do not have the authority to do. When I first started digging into this, for sure, I thought they had the uh, agents going to professional forensics instruction courses and completing tests and so forth and being evaluated. But it turns out, according to John Buscaglia, he created the forensics classes in which the Border Patrol critical incident teams were supposed to use. Here it says in September, from September 1997 to 1998, he developed the courses for the Border Patrol critical incident teams in Artesia, New Mexico, which is where the Border Patrol Academy is held. Quote, develop three courses for both journeymen and senior classes instructing agents in the identification and preservation process of critical incident scenes, parentheses, vehicle collisions, and shooting incidents. Educated senior agents in scene management best practices upon arrival at critical incident scenes, including evidence preservation, potential witness identification, notification and medical request assurance, time of arrival, attending individual documentation, monitoring mental capacity of all individuals involved in the incident and same relinquishment procedures. So apparently the Border Patrol somehow trained John Buscaglia in what they wanted him to do for critical incident teams, which they don't have the authority to do, and then assigned him to turn around and go to the academy and develop the uh, course development that they wanted to teach the next agents coming through these Border, Pat Border Patrol critical incident teams. From October 1996 to no. November 2003, he was a supervisor in Campo and also in New Mexico and in Arizona. I just want to disclose that he was actually my supervisor at Campo for a little while. He was a pretty nice guy when I met him there. Here, he continues to state that he is the one who orchestrated the development and implementation of a sector evidence team. Remember, that's another name for a critical incident team. At the request of then Chief Patrol Agent of Tucson Sector, David Aguilar, inclusive of team member selection, equipment purchase, vehicle assignment, and training. He directed three teams. So what he's saying here is in Tucson, instead of one team that they had in San Diego, they now have three teams so that they can cover 24-7. Directed three teams consisting of seven team members, led initial training activities providing instruction on process identification, evidence preservation, and witness interview completion. He designed, assigned, reviewed, and submitted completed cases to the chief patrol agent, also headed a binational course regarding critical incidents to Grupo Beta from Sonora, Mexico, and Grupo Beta team from Baja, California. So <laughs> essentially what he's saying here is in the times where a border patrol agent is standing on U.S. soil and shoots into Mexico and kills somebody, what they did because it was happening so often during that time, especially in the, uh, in the Nogales area, what they did was they offered to teach the Mexican authorities how they should conduct their in investigations. So not only is the Border Patrol doing illegal investigations and doing the evidence and deciding what the evidence is and everything, they are now going into Mexico and teaching the Mexican authorities how to collect and how to do evidence the way that they want it to be done. So they're covering all their bases. From 2003 to 2006, John Buscaglia was a field operations supervisor. That means he's a supervisor of the supervisors. And so he states here he established a sector evidence team, again, another name for a critical incident team, at the request of then Chief Patrol Agent Raymond Ortega, including team member selection 
equipment purchase, case assignment, and case review. He also instituted a liaison with local, state, and federal law enforcement authorities related to critical incidents. So you may be asking, like, what did the Border Patrol tell state and local and federal authorities when they created these teams? This is exactly what they used to tell the agencies who were charged with investigating use of force incidents when the critical incident teams came about. They said, it's not really an investigative team. It's not an evidence collection team. What it is, is a liaison with you all who are investigating us so that if you need an agent for maybe a deposition, you give me a call, I'll find that agent for you and I'll get it. Do you need a videotape from the port or do you need a videotape from the station? I can get that for you. So that's what the Border Patrol told the existing agencies who were investigating them at the time. Another thing we used to tell the agencies who normally investigated our use of force incidents is that these teams were created for when the incidents occurred way out in the middle of nowhere, which is quite frequent. That That is actually a lie because we see these criminal incident teams working right in the middles of cities, right next to police departments, right next to, to very dense populations and so forth. So that's, that's not true at all. And then from December 2007 to March 2014, when he retired, he was in the Laredo district. He had oversight of the Laredo sector evidence team, again, critical incident team. And he solicited interviews and selected team members for the team. He provided training for the team members, monitored their progression, and mentored the team members. He set their goals and completed evaluations and gave them annual appraisals, including annual awards. So you may be wondering how it is the Border Patrol came up with all the funding for these teams if Congress didn't even know about it. Well, prior to 9-11, under the old system, under Immigration Naturalization Service, the Border Patrol chiefs would hide the funding for these teams within the already existing intelligence units. After 9-11, they would hide the funds for the critical incident teams and the purchasing for the training for those teams by using Customs and Border Protection's Laboratory Science Services as the purchaser. When exactly Customs and Border Protection became aware of the cover-up team's illegality, I don't know. But through my research of government purchasing logs, it's clear to me that they knew that the critical incident teams from the Border Patrol were illegal by at least 2006, which is just three years after the agency was created. The purchasing records for the critical incident teams within the Border Patrol were listed deep within the contracts for Customs and Border Protection's Laboratory Science Services procurement records. It is only once you open the files and read the orders that you can see that the training for crash scene investigations, funds for latent fingerprint fuming chamber systems, 3D crime scene scanners, evidence processing software, and other forensic-based purchases were actually for the Border Patrol critical incident teams. However, it appears that Customs and Border Protection moved the critical incident team's training from the isolated Border Patrol Academy to actual forensics accredited studies. Although this is a good move, Border Patrol still did not have and still does not have the authority to conduct these investigations. It is rare to see any mention of Border Patrol critical incident teams in the media, but occasionally I have found some articles where a press information officer accidentally mentioned their existence. As this article demonstrated, these teams confused even their own union attorneys. Rarer still is to find government documents discussing the teams and their work. Prior to 2014, the Border Patrol's use of force handbook given to agents was designated as a law enforcement sensitive document. This means it was not available to the public or the press. It was only after the brutal killing of Anastasio Hernandez Rojas in 2010 by San Diego Border Patrol agents and Customs and Border Patrol officers at the San Ysidro Port of Entry that the agency was forced to give the secret existing 2010 use of force handbook over to the Police Executive Research Forum, also called PERF. PERF is considered to be an independent group of law enforcement experts used to evaluate law enforcement agencies and their programs all around the country. In their February 2013 report, PERF experts singled out the mention of the secret teams in the handbook. They noted 
that the handbook required agents to notify the Border Patrol critical incident teams first before contacting the actual investigative teams outside of the agency. Perf's recommendation on the 2010 Use of Force Handbook was that they need to explain what these teams were used for. But instead of doing the right thing and explaining what the teams were for, I mean, since they're illegal, they can't really explain what they're for. Border Patrol management just had any mention of the Border Patrol critical incident teams removed in their new public forward-facing 2014 use of force handbook. And therefore, that continued the secrecy of the cover-up teams. Also in 2014, then-Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, Gil Karolikowski, announced the creation of the National Use of Force Review Board. This review board intended to assure the public and Congress that the questions that arose from the failed investigations into the Hernandez-Rojas case and many others would then be reviewed by, in their words, these are their words, quote, senior leaders from Customs and Border Protection, the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, and U.S. and Immigration Customs Enforcement, assigned to review use of force incidents resulting in serious physical injury or death or any incident involving the discharge of a firearm in a non-training setting. However, Commissioner Karolikowski also sent an internal directive to Border Patrol stating what actually would happen with these National Use of Force Review Boards. This directive from Karolikowski clearly stated that when the National Use of Force Review Board and their independent use of force investigative teams were created, the teams were never actually impartial or independent, but corrupted from their inception as the new oversight groups were required to still use the secret and illegal Border Patrol critical incident teams as their investigative unit. Other than court filings and transcripts that I'm going to discuss in future articles and in videos in this series, the only other reference I have been able to find in government forward-facing documents in regard to Border Patrol critical incident teams is from the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division when they refused to bring charges against an agent for the killing of Ramsey's Barone Torres. Here's the report and explanation given by the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division that the Tucson Border Patrol critical incident team was directed by the FBI to investigate and collect evidence, even though the team had no legal authority to do so by Congress. The Civil Rights Division went further in the footnote to explain the purpose of the Border Patrol critical incident teams. This footnote is not only misleading, but also simply not true, and in fact gave the family and their attorneys the impression that the Border Patrol critical incident teams were a legal and authorized evidence collection team. So this is what happens in the future with all these teams. What I found out is they start out as saying, we're just here to be a liaison so you can get a hold of agents that you need to talk to so you can get a hold of evidence. But what it turns out being, and what you'll see in the future with individual cases that I bring up, is that the investigative agencies who have worked for years on these Border Patrol critical incidents, they use the Border Patrol critical incident teams to do evidence identification, evidence collection, and the analysis of that evidence to write their reports. So the Border Patrol was always dictating what was evidence. They were collecting it poorly, which you're going to see in future episodes. And then they were also poorly analyzing this for the FBI, for local and state authorities, for Customs and Border Protection, and for the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General. So the Border Patrol is controlling the whole investigation because they're the ones that are deciding what is evidence, what is not, and then how they collected it. So in 2019, when the Southern Border Communities Coalition asked me to review the Anastasio Hernandez Rojas case, I told them everything I knew about the units. I knew they covered up crimes, and I had even witnessed it on one occasion. Fortunately, in that shooting, nobody was injured. The only good thing to come out of the Hernandez Rojas case was that it was well documented by the San Diego Police Department, and it included all the movements of the San Diego Border Patrol critical incident team. The family's attorneys knew the team was a cover-up unit, but they just didn't understand how it worked or how the agency had gotten away with it. That was what I could help them with. 
So then I spent the next few years and thousands of my own dollars to find and collect court documents about the unit. And then I turned all my research over to the Southern Border Communities Coalition. In October of 2021, the Southern Border Communities Coalition sent their complaint to Congress. In January of 2022, congressional members of several congressional committees demanded investigations into the cover-up teams. On May 2022, then Customs and Border Protections Commissioner Chris Magnus ordered the elimination of the Border Patrol critical incident teams. Commissioner Magnus then issued a memorandum stating that Border Patrol agents assigned to the Border Patrol critical incident teams would be retained by simply moving them from Border Patrol to Customs and Border Protections Office of Professional Responsibility. This meant that the same agents responsible for 35 years of secret cover-ups and obstruction of justice were now legalized under Customs and Border Protection. This memorandum also stated that the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division would investigate the cover-up teams prior to them being legalized. This is the same Civil Rights Division that used the illegal Border Patrol critical incident teams investigations to deny cases for 35 years. So there's a conflict of interest here. And the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division cannot be trusted to conduct this investigation. So currently, the former illegal and secret critical incident teams of the Border Patrol have been rolled into Customs and Border Protection's Office of Professional Responsibility and are being used today as evidence collection teams for current cases. No agent has ever been held accountable for these teams or their actions. In fact, the first killing committed by Border Patrol agents after they were moved under the Office of Professional Responsibility's directions was once again cleared, even though three out of the 10 agents present that night did not fire their weapons. So that means 70% of the agents on scene did not think it was a good shoot. Only 30% of the agents there fired and killed Mr. Matia. The family's attorney hasn't even been given a reason of why they shot in the first place. So the cover-ups continue. So join me next time. I'm going to have a family member of one of the victims of the Border Patrol critical incident teams. He was apprehended. He was arrested at the Interstate 8 checkpoint here in Pine Valley, California, in San Diego sector, where I used to work as a Border Patrol agent. He was found with three pounds of marijuana on him. He's an American citizen. Six hours later, he's dead, laying on a Border Patrol uh, cell floor. He never received an investigation by any agent agency with any authority. And in fact, I have written documentation that the San Diego sheriffs allowed the Border Patrol critical incident team to do the homicide investigation into this man. This man was an American citizen. He never, ever received an actual investigation, a legitimate legal investigation into his death. We're going to talk to his sister on the next show. This is why I always say honor first is a lie.